Okay, welcome. My name is Akasemi Newsom. And I'm Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies here at the University of California, Berkeley. We're honored to bring you this event today titled Whiteness and Collective Trauma in the Rearview Mirror as a moderated conversation between myself and two accomplished journalists from Germany, Alice Hasters and Mohammed Amjahid. This event is the first in a series of conversations on memory culture in Germany, launched by the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley, by the Pacific Regional Office of the German Historical Institute of Washington, DC, the Goethe Institute of San Francisco, and the German Academic Exchange Service, or the GAD. The series has been launched to examine the relationship of recent reckonings in Germany with racism and colonial violence, uh, the relationship to Germany's longstanding reckonings with its Nazi past. We're going to be introducing perspectives from art, photography, architecture, and material culture rooted in memorial sites and museums, as well as in film, literature, and podcasts. Our goal with this series is to address the role of race and racism in determining who can legitimately remember the nation's past in Germany, what constitutes the bounds of the national past, and the ways in which it has been and continues to be remembered. Now, a few housekeeping details. This is a hybrid event that's accessible on Zoom webinar. Virtual audience members should post their questions in the Q&A box on their screen. For the first 45 minutes, I'll pose questions to our panelists. And then for the second 45 minutes, we'll turn to questions from the in-person and virtual audience. Now a bit about our speakers. Alice Hasters was born in Cologne in 1989 and works in Berlin as a writer for several German media outlets, including Rundfunk Brandenburg Berlin, Tagesschau, and Deutschlandfunk, among others. Together with Maxi Hecke, she hosts Feuer and Brot, a monthly podcast on feminism and pop culture. Her book, Was Weiße Menschen nicht über Rassismus hören wollen, aber wissen sollten, or What White People Don't Want to Hear About Racism But Should Know, was published in 2019 by Hansa Blau and became a bestseller. Our next panelist, Mohammed Amjahid, was born as the son of so-called guest workers in Frankfurt am Main in 1988. He studied political science in Berlin and Cairo. After completing his master's degree, Amjahid worked for several prominent German, German newspapers. He is now a freelance investigative journalist currently working on several new book projects. His latest book was published in 2021 by Piper Publishing and is titled Der Weiße Fleck, eine Anwandtung zu antirassistischem Denken or Whitewash, 
a guide to anti-racist thinking. So without further ado, a warm welcome to our panelists and let's get started with the discussion. So the first question I'd like to pose to both of you is what is German memory culture, including education, including memorization, as it's connected to the Holocaust? And drawing from examples in your biography, education, and professional lives as, as journalists, when and how did you first encounter German memory culture? So which, I don't know, which one do you like to go? <laughs> this is interesting. This, yeah, I want to. Here you, you want to know what I'm, I'm just saying? Okay, thank you first for having us. Thank you so thank much you. for the introduction. And it, of course, it's a big question. And in my book, I have um, I have a chapter where I write about memory culture. And before I go to uh, the critical view on what German uh, memory culture is, I state that it's part of the identity in German politics and discourse. And it's actually something very important to have in Germany, knowing about the history and what Germans actually did, not only in Germany or Europe, but also to the world, not only in the first, but also, of course, uh, in the Second World War. Um, having that as part of German identity is crucial. At the same time, German memory culture or remembrance culture is something very German centered. I try to keep it very short, but my main critique would be that it became something that is centering German identity and well being over actually talking about how we can uh, prevent this happening again when it comes to Holocaust, for example. And what I guess we are arguing is that we need to. Um, that we need to read German history in the context, not saying that the Nazi era began in 33 and ended in 45. This is what a lot of school books would teach, uh, for example, uh, young people, but that we have to see it in the historical context, actually, and that therefore we have to talk about German colonialism, for example, because it is connected to what happened after 33, and that there are continuities after 45. These are like very simple things I'm like stating, but a lot of white Germans would be very offended if a black woman or a Mohammed would write this. And this is why we need to have this competition actually in Germany. Yeah, they have gotten offended. They, it yeah. already happened. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I can just add, I think this, uh, you stated, already a lot of um, important things. Um, my um, critique to German remembrance culture is that it seems to fail to adapt to um, what is needed in the present times. So, and that became very clear when um, the right-wing party AfD, Alternative für Deutschland, uh, gained popularity in, um, yeah, it started um, in 2015, and then they got elected into the uh, German Bundestag in 2017. And um, you saw that these narratives of um, remembrance culture, um, they don't add up anymore, and they don't help to prevent uh, right-wing uh, ideology is becoming, um, you know, kind of mainstream again in uh, Germany. And so um, I think it's very important that Germans have to revisit how they talk about their past, how they fail to um, connect it to the present, and how they fail to um, connect it to, as you say, uh, as you already said, um, colonialism, to um, global narratives of oppression and um, uh, yeah, discrimination. And um, that, yeah, and for me as a black German, being, um, you know, the daughter of a 
white German men and a, a black American um, woman, uh, I also experienced that there is no space or no narrative for me. How do I connect or how do I dock on these on this remembrance culture? Because there is only this, or it's very centered around this narrative of, um, um, as Moment actually already stated, is very centered around the uh, well-being of um, descendants of um, the people who are actually, um, yeah, fighting uh, for the Nazis. Or, yes. And it's so um, there's a lot of things are missing in remembrance culture. And also there is this notion of um, it hasn't happy, it had a happy ending, you know, mm -hmm. then it was, Hitler was gone. And um, then it's almost, people almost tell it like there was after 45, there was like a spell that was broken and people woke up again and they weren't racist anymore. And all of this vanished and people, everything blossomed again, which of course it's not true. And um, so there's a lot to still unpack and um, yeah, to go dig deeper into. Yeah. May I add something like very important for me is to state that there is the possibility to talk about colonialism and the Holocaust at the same time. Like, because people who were offended, they would like, oh, all these black people, all these people of color, they want to talk only about colonialism. I'm like, no, actually, I care for my Jewish and Roma and queer friends. They have like this very, um, this very, uh, how to say, this history full of violence. And it's something that we need to talk about, but there is this connection actually between the knowledge, so-called knowledge production during the colonial era and how, what Germans actually did with it uh, during the Holocaust. That's the first thing. And the second thing I have the advantage that I didn't go to school in Germany. Um, my, I'm born in Germany and my parents actually decided to leave when I was seven, you know, because weather is bad and food is bad and whatever. <laughs> so they were like, let's go back to Morocco. And I went to school in Morocco and then I, went back to Germany to study, but I needed like, um, I needed to, the, the German, the German education system didn't want me to um, study right away. I needed like to do the Abitur, the diploma again, the school diploma. And the person in administration argue, argued that I need to do that with the sentence, you also need to know who Hitler was. I'm like, Guess what? Mm -hmm. Out there, people know who Hitler was and what he did, you know? And this is like the kind, like, as a journalist, I like to illustrate and explain with, um, with, uh, with, you know, this kind of scenes and anecdotes. And that was clearly some kind of white supremacy, actually, me sitting in front of this person and he's thinking like, oh, this person came from Africa and he doesn't know what happened. I'm like, I know, mm -hmm. and it's not good for you that I know actually. So this is also a kind of like uh, some, I call it like remembrance supremacy in German discourse. Yeah. Well, if I may follow up on, on my question, could you say a bit more about what the German memory culture has to do with whiteness and, and be descriptive? Um, so it's, and the whole problem in, um, in Germany is that people are not really aware. They don't talk about whiteness as, um, as something that is crucial or in, within, um, yeah, uh, the narrative of, uh, the Nazi rule. Um, so in remembrance culture, people really don't explore how, what it was building this identity or where it came from to build this identity. And it's also very much placed on, uh, so I would say this, the simplified narrative that students um, get 
taught in school or that they take out of school is that Hitler was this guy who was like this evil genius who wrote Mein Kampf and then he invented all of these, all of this, um, all of the ideology and then everybody bought it, everybody read it and then that was, um, that is how uh, Germans perception of whiteness came to be, which is not true because it's very, because um, there is a lot of information missing. And it's uh, so as a consequence, it is shocking to Germans when you talk about whiteness now. It's like you would, a lot of times they would say, you are bringing something back that we already overcame. Um, but as a non-white person, you see it all the time that you haven't overcome this. And I also found very interesting your um, aspect of remembrance supremacy and who is actually allowed to remember and to add their perspective to the conversation. Um, because there's also this, yeah, even unnoticed notion that, um, yeah, we are only talking about one perspective. So when I was um, as a student, I thought there weren't during um, during uh, the Nazi rule there weren't black people in Germany. I thought they just they didn't exist because they weren't there yet or something. Which of course I found out later was not true. But I thought. Um, I never, there was never an answer for me, for example, what would have happened to me? What, what, what would have been my reality in, um, in this time? But you, when you go and research that, you see how many things are still present in the minds and in the, you know, um, in Germany, because, you know, in for example, in Germany, uh, black people um, had only a chance to survive in, during Nazi rule when um, they would go into t entertainment mm -hmm. and they would um, do participate in this uh, propaganda for Germany to bring back to be um, a colonial uh, power again. So black people were very much associated with it, entertainment, with acting, singing, dancing. And I, as a black German growing up, I was always confronted with people asking me, do you sing, do you dance? Because that is what Germans think about black people, that they only, that they only do this. And to understand where this is coming from was actually also, I see it in, the presence again, and um, there are many more examples. I don't want to add too much to it, but, no, but for you, example, yeah. you are right. Like I think the most important thing talking about history is to get the facts. Mm -hmm. It would be ridiculous to come here to the U.S. and say the problem was or is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. He didn't fall from the moon. He came actually from Germany. So sorry about that, <laughs> or his ancestors. But you know, like. When 60 million people vote for that person plus, it would be ridiculous to, to, to say that, that only that one person is the problem. So we need actually to have a critical conversation about what's wrong with the whole system. That's the first thing. And then I try to, I, I tried to uh, suggest three uh, points where I would say, okay, these are actually the points that I would like to talk about. Like very quickly, um, in German, I call it something like um, Erinnerungskultur Exportweltmeister. Those studying German is like, it's a very long word, but Germans, they love to export stuff, you know, cars that are broken and stuff. So mm -hmm. what they would, what they also like to export is remembrance culture. Actually, they would go, to Tunisia after the revolution in 2011 and tell them we would we will teach you how to do remembrance actually you need to talk about our history and then you're good which is like a problem because people in Tunisia would have their own history and they would like to talk about that 
So this let's export something that actually came from the suffering of so many minorities, so many people, that's one big problem for me. The second thing is the Wiedergutwerdung, like becoming the good German again. Look, we did this and this is so, so bad, but now we are the nicest guys on earth, nicest people on earth actually. And this is something which is like this transformation or um, putting German history in value actually, that you have the president and he would sit there and he would say something like, yeah, we learned from our history and now you have to learn from us because we know better. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a very weird twist, like something that I would, I didn't see happening, you know, when um, I was like studying all the texts and the, the uh, conversations, especially uh, among politicians. So that's another problem. And the third thing is um, that the center was, I think, at uh, one point that this shouldn't happen again. And this shifted away. We don't have like, and that's, that's a huge problem. People would tell me, white Germans would tell me something like, if I would live in 1934, I would go to the resistance. I would, I would fight Hitler. I'm like, no, actually, you would actually be in the Ministry of Propaganda and maybe be like something very high uh, in, in, in rank working on um, Nazi propaganda because it was so powerful to persuade so many white Germans. So it was not Hitler alone. So this nie wieder, this it should never happen again, actually is not in the center anymore. And this is what makes a lot of um, underserved communities and vulnerable minorities very worried in Germany. Hmm. Well, to just shift topics slightly, um, especially in light of what you said about never again, can you describe the NSU murders for um, the many Americans in our audience? What happened and how was it covered by journalists in Germany. What's the connection between this case and the issue of structural racism and policing in Germany? And how have these debates been part of or not been included in German memory culture? Do you want to summarize or do pro? So go, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so the NSU very, very briefly was a murder series uh, that uh, happened um, in the 2000s, uh, mostly, um, where a network of neo-Nazis actually were so organized in and ideologically focused in killing people of color, mostly those read as Muslims. And they would go and travel from city to city and just kill randomly people. They would see someone in a shop from Turkish descent and they would kill that person. And that for years, that happened for years. I say small shop owners. Small shop owners. Um, and they just could do it and no one caught them because uh, police and security forces, they were like, oh, these are brown people killing each other. Actually, they would go to the families and they say, no, you know, you are all criminals. So you're killing, you killed your husband. And in media, they would portray this as um, Döner murder, as the kebab murders. You know, they invented also this racist framing in describing this uncivilized brown people, Muslim people who are not able to talk to each other, so they kill each other. At one point, this network actually um, they um, they decided to just uh, to just announce that they did it, and then two very uh, important key figures in this network, they killed themselves. And the third person was then captured, but it's not only three people, they needed a big, big network actually. And this is a good illustration of how German society and the German state actually uh, failed in this case, um, a lot of people actually. They did. What 
And also it continued that the murder trial for this uh, one person who actually um, uh, was framed as the one of three people who organized everything. Um, that went on for years in Munich. Um, and it was a very frustrating um, trial for the people who were, um, for the, um, the relatives. The relatives. For the relatives, exactly. So because they weren't taken seriously, there was uh, a lot of chaos when it, when it came to um, showing evidence. There was a lot of things were going wrong and it was um, actually, it's really hard to explain why it took so many years. And then at the end, nothing really came of it because um, Beate Chapel was arrested, but um, they still held on to that theory or to that notion that it was just the three of them. They had like other uh, people in, um, within the trial, but they never really, there was never really a motivation to go there to expose the network that it clearly, um, that it clearly is. And it's because in Germany, there was, you have to imagine, there was, up to that point, there was also already tremendous um, suffering because that's how, so all, yeah, as Mohamed already described, um, they were targeted by investigators um, and by the police. They couldn't, um, so they had to, um, prove their innocence and when it came out that this was um, this Nazi network, people were really eminent to say, oh, it was just the, these three people. And in Germany, there is a lot of, um, yeah, there's this telling about like the lone wolves. Um, it's kind of similar to like the bad apple thing that people say within the police. It's just like, it's not a structural problem and it's not a it's not a big threat. It's just individuals that do get radicalized, but then you can't really you can't do anything about it because it's these individuals, but all in all, everything is fine. Um, there's also this is not this was um, a, a series of murder that was going on for a long time, but it wasn't the only um, um, it wasn't the only time people uh, got killed in Germany um, by, uh, by Nazis, by a uh, racist attack. There was also this terrorist attack during um, the Oktoberfest, for example, a couple of years prior, uh, where a bomb went off. And people just failed to make connections or ask questions along these lines. There were, um, and still today, um, there's a lot of open, um, there are a lot of open questions. And the most worrisome thing is that it, there's a high, or it's very clear that people who are working within the German Secret Service as undercover, um, you know, undercover people, um, they, that they somehow, were involved in these murder series. There's especially one case of, um, you say, like, you could say like, a, it's called Faulmann. It's like a double, you could say it's like a double agent, like a secret agent person. Um, he was actually there when one of the people in the NSO uh, murder series got killed and he claims that he did not notice it which is in a very next small room. He was next to him and he went out. So there are a lot of these things. And then there is a lot of, um, and then also the files of that, uh, this uh, the Secret Service files, they are sealed for the next 80 years. It was 120 years before. And then after another person, this time a German politician called Vatka Lücke brought, um, uh, was murdered in 2019, they um, shortened the 
the deadline, but it was is still 80 years. So there is no chance for us to really find out at least if nothing changes. So there is still fighting going on, but it really exposed that. Um, and it yeah arose the question of how much um, how involved is our German institutions, such as the police, but also as the Secret Service, the uh, justice system, how well connected are they, or how, what is the connection to um, right wing terrorists groups? Why are they so? Why do they put so much effort in not exposing them? Mm -hmm. And um, to when you realize that, it's um, extremely scary um, and you see how after the NSU there were also other terrorist attacks um, by right-wing extremists. Um, in 2019 there was an attack on a synagogue in Halle. Um, there was this murder of Vata and in 2020 uh, nine people got murdered in Hanau by um, uh, yeah, by a man who then afterwards killed himself. And these times, all these, um, every time it was also placed on the lone wolf theory. So also no connection to any, to nothing that happened before. And this is very frustrating and also very scary. I think also in the US, one of the biggest threats is white supremacy terrorist attacks, actually. And like, um, uh, as a journalist, as an investigative journalist, I worked a lot uh, on Islamist attacks, for example, also in Berlin. Um, but the framing was like, oh, these brown people actually are the, are, are the problem. And we do not have like, because as white people, we're civilized, we don't kill people. And you would think that after the NSO, the German state would understand the problem. As an investigative journalist, I have the privilege to have a look to documents I shouldn't actually see. And I could, with all these cases that Alice just mentioned, see that they're not learning at all. Actually, it's always the same. It's always like, if you see in Halle, there was like a, this white supremacist who had the plan to go and kill people in the synagogue and then kill people in the mosque. And because there's no mosque in Halle that he could find, so he went to the kebab shop, to the small business owner. So there you could think that the state would understand that there's like a huge problem in Germany with this white supremacist violence, but they just don't take it serious. So more and more people die. And this is connected from my point of view to this romantic, uh, roman romantic view on German history. The, this romantic view on German history states that G white Germans are good. They cannot do harm. And this is why a lot of people are very relaxed in Germany, working in police forces and parties in the government by saying, these are single cases. We don't have structures, even though the structures are known to everybody. Mm -hmm. There is a big problem with white supremacists and right-wing extremists within police forces. We do have the same problems, similar problems in the US. It's not like, we are describing new things and everybody is like, I never heard of it. This is like out there, this is in the internet. Just Google it for two seconds. So my conclusion is that a lot of people who ha are in power, they don't want to change anything because it feels comfortable to say, we did the Holocaust and now we are good and you have to accept that. Mm -hmm. As a follow-up, so to what extent are these uh, challenges, these problems with white supremacy linked to the rise of the AfD, to the right-wing extremist party? Is it something uh, to do really with the far right and its rise? Or is it something that you see uh, widespread across the political party spectrum? Uh, and, and Whatever your position on this, can you provide some examples of um, you know, this relationship between whiteness, white supremacy, and memory culture on the good uh, German who could never um, yeah. be racist? So it's definitely both. 
I think uh, for a long time there was this, um, yeah, this relaxed uh, notion that people said, well, all, all in all, we're good. We are, um, we're active in remembrance culture. And then there is, a, you know, there's this inevitable tiny percent of right-wing extremists. You can't get rid of them, but there are so few. Um, we don't really have to worry about it. And then um, this thinking was has always been wrong, but the the AfD really showed that this is not adding up at all because people didn't know, especially in um, this is or this is my experience, and journalists didn't know how to tell how to talk about the AfD. And people and other politicians didn't know how to react to the AfD because a lot of people were saying at the beginning, oh, we have to listen to their concerns. Their concerns, their concerns were that there are too many Muslims coming in mostly, but then also too many uh, black and brown people coming into Germany and we're worried about the German culture. So it's, it was very much framed about protecting German culture. Also, uh, kind of also, and that was that is even more um, outrageous. And coming back to remembrance supremacy, that they would also not like that they would also ruin the remembrance culture in some ways. Like that they uh, mm -hmm. would that anti-Semitism would be on the rise if they would come in and stuff. So they actually used that narrative of remembrance culture to actually. Um, justify, um, yeah, anti-Muslim uh, narratives actually too. So it's a lot of, so it really got exposed that, yeah, there is um, a very, because people, um, German people, they often say, um, uh, we don't know who we are, the, our identity is the lack of identity and we're kind of proud about that they let go of any notions of uh, patriotism or like national pride or something. But as it turns out, Germans didn't let go of that. And um, they very much imagine, uh, or a lot of Germans really uh, very much imagine Germany to be a white country. And they are, there is this scare or this talk about Germany wouldn't be Germany anymore if the if there would be more people of color and more black people, then Germany would lose its Germanness. So people like Mohammed, people like me, we can't we can't be German. We can't carry like there. It's just in the minds of German, it's not possible. And this is what they want to protect Germany from. Um, and and so people, a lot of people wouldn't see this as a racist right wing view. They would say, oh yeah, well, I can understand. Like this was, there was an openness to this argument and to this, um, people gave the, the AfD and, and this conversations a lot of space and room to, flourish and discuss people from the FDA were invited into talk shows they could state their facts and or their facts their non-facts <laughs> their alternative facts so that is um so in that period of time when they were actually uh, on the rise you could actually see how remembrance culture is not is not doing what it's supposed to do which is actually, yeah, um, enabling Germans to understand when these narratives arise again and actually say no to them. <laughs> and that did not work. Or in a lot of ways, I mean, I of course, there were also people uh, rising up. There were a lot of demonstrations against um, the AfD and their politics, but at the end of the day, they are in parliament with 13% uh, of the vote, and which is mm, still there um, uh, before 
in the last legislate, um, legislation, they were the biggest opposition. Um, yeah. I'm and, done. <laughs> um, I would argue and say um, definitely it's th that problem you find it in all kinds of parties in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Definitely in the conservative parties, that would be too easy here to, you know, trash them. So I go trash the progressives. Um, mm -hmm. You have the case in the Green Party, which is now part of the government, that you have like um, a mayor of a smaller city called Tübingen, where I used to live for one year. It's like if you want to say German Pete Buttigieg, but with no charisma and just very racist point of views. And he would like say, you know, our Germanness is in danger because we has too many black and brown people, for example. He would go into a park and say, oh, there are too many black people here. Like this, this like the level of discussions actually in Germany. You would have in SPD a politician called Tiro Zarazin. He wrote actually a book, which was the biggest bestseller after, one of the biggest bestsellers after the war. And actually what he did is he was like, Arabs and Turks are genetically not able to be educated and they are just selling vegetables. And this is why they should go home little, because yeah. we have nothing to do with them. We have nothing to do with them. It's a little bit like the bell curve. Uh, yes. And, yeah. yeah. And so, and you would have in the very lefty party in the parliament, you would have someone called Zara Wagenknecht. And not only she's like with Putin also right now in this, um, very critical days and weeks uh, she would also argue that all these brown refugees they would come and take uh, take the opportunities away from our white hard-working people german people and then you would actually have a look into the parliament and say okay what can i for whom can i vote as a person of color as a racialized person actually and the answer is like i don't know to be honest the Specific problem with the AfD is that in Germany, financing is always state centered. But like here in the US, where you do a lot of uh, fundraising, for example, and have like a lot of private uh, persons or companies or whatever giving money, everything is, you know, coming from the state. So the AfD is a very good opportunity to nourish right wing white supremacist groups. Um, not only through the party very directly, but also through other possibilities. There is um, a system of um, foundations who are connected to parties and they get now 70 million euros. And you know that this is going to NSU-like networks, for example. And letting this happen is a very good illustration that in Germany, we still are not taking this never again seriously mm -hmm. because you know that this is not a sustainable way to take care of minorities and targeted groups. You cannot say, we are sorry that we did this to the Jewish community and at the same time give money to an institution that is giving that money to potentially right-wing extremists. So this is where you really can very in a very concrete way, state that there is something very wrong with the system itself. Mm -hmm. Can I just add something to that? Which is, what I also find very, um, yeah, infuriating is that also, it's not that the AfD wouldn't, they would also try to um, argue with remembrance culture. Yes. They would say, um, and it's, uh, we have, parallels to the discourse in the States as well, that people are really um, saying it's freedom of speech and we are allowed to say um, what we want. So they basically say, uh, we have a right to be racist and that's, and we have a right to um, share our racist views. And if you take this away from me, that would be, you would do the things that Nazis did, like, you would, this is kind of how they want to twist it. It's if, um, and they, so we have also um, in Germany, they would compare like right wing groups, they would actually compare themselves to people being in the resistance against yeah. the Nazis. Um, sometimes also kind of hidden um, 
we have that in Germany and also in the States, the anti-vax movement is also in large parts, um, um, yeah, right-wing um, has a big, yeah, right-wing, yeah, influence, influence there. And um, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, it's very easy to, uh, yeah, push right-wing ideologies within that anti-vax movement. But the anti-vax movement is actually doing um, posing with, um, uh, with saying there was this person saying she, she's like Sophie Scholl, which is a very uh, prominent figure in the uh, resistance. Or they would pose, um, they would put like the Judenstern, so the Jewish star that uh, um, uh, Jews were forced to wear uh, under the Nazi rule. They would uh, put this as a symbol as um as uh like dystopia where these people were marked as not vaccinated so they would compare it it's they would compare this to um being suppressed and being like i don't know they put themselves in the position of the oppressed and about um and um this is so so it's not like they would openly say oh we are we were, we are pro Hitler, we are with the Nazis. No, they would also say like, oh, we are, they will tap in this, into this remembrance uh, narrative, but trying to twist it as though they are the victims and they are the ones protecting uh, or trying to protect a certain, uh, this certain remembrance culture from people coming in and uh, destroying it. And this is also, um, so you really have to ask yourself, uh, we really have to sharpen the narrative about uh, remembrance culture when it can be abused like that and people are not quick enough to notice it. And one very interesting way that I observe often in Germany is like that Germans would like to talk about anti-Semitism, for example, but among brown people, you know? Mm -hmm. And they would be surprised when I say, yes, of course, there's anti-Semitism everywhere. You find racism everywhere. You find sexism and uh, transphobia, for example, everywhere. They would like, uh, what? You would, would like also to talk about anti-Semitism among Muslim communities? And like, of course. It would be like having looking at the word in an essentialist way does not make sense from my perspective. But this essentialist way from a very wide, very German perspective would say a white German person is immune against being anti-Semitic because we did our homework. Mm. And my response would be like, this is very dangerous. This like putting this as a fact, actually, this is what all the celebrations are about, you know? Mm -hmm. This is where we need to begin as targeted minorities to worry about our security. Because then you don't see actually the structural problems and you don't have the opportunity to, to discuss solutions or mark them as problems in the first place. So this is also some kind of interesting discourses that as a person of color, as a black person, you always, have to deal with how to navigate actually this kind of this, uh, discussions and conversations to circle back always to the security of the target groups. Mm -hmm. so. One more theme I would like you all to address before we turn to the questions I'm sure are piling up in our audience. What role does colonialism play in German memory culture. We saw in the news about the, uh, not quite reparations, but the recognition of the German government of the genocide of the Herero and Nama in Namibia. Um, how is colonialism covered by journalists in Germany? And how do you think of the practice of remembering or not remembering uh, colonialism is linked to whiteness um, in Germany and, and also in Europe more, more broadly. What would you have to say about that? 
I mean, the fact that we are still hearing now in the news that people, that the German uh, government is recognizing the genocide uh, against the Herero and Nama people is actually, yeah, also infuriating because it is, this happened um, in 1904. <laughs> so it took more than a hundred years for people to actually, um, uh, yeah, starting to or actually the german german people didn't want to recognize or um this as a genocide and they also don't want to pay reparations they said they paid reparations but it's actually a it's actually renaming a sum that they give to the namibian government anyways basically and it's not and the herero and the nama people actually don't see any any of that sum of money going from the German government to um, the Namibian government. So, um, and that only happened because of um, the, that had, that that actually happened, had a lot to do with the Black Lives Matter movement gaining popularity and momentum in 2020. But before that, um, if you would ask Germans, about their role in um, colonialism and imperial in the imperialist era, people would say, oh no, but the Germans didn't have anything to do with it because we lost the uh, territory so early and it was the, um, the British and the, the French and uh, you know, the Portuguese who were really, or the Spanish who were really the, uh, the bad, people. So Germans really never saw themselves as, as um, they thought they didn't partake in that. But it is really, I think it's very crucial to know, uh, of course, and uh, German uh, remembrance culture should also include colonialism. It should also include the genocide against um, Hero and Nama people. And it should include, um, you know, the, the you know the war against the Machi Machi people in um, uh, the east, the territory in um, East Africa. All of this is not really known in Germany, and also people uh, should know that because um, a lot of racist thinking still survives that. Uh, in German children books, songs, movies, a lot of, there was, I could go into, I could name a lot of things right now that um, you see still resemble um, things of like old colonial um, narratives, anti-Black narratives that play a huge role still in um, and also in the present, um, in the present day. Um, but people now, which is also very frustrating, um, since everything um, seems to be a competition, people would, if you um, put this criticism forward, people say you, or what I heard a lot of times, when I said, well, it's very important that we learn about the German role on colonialism, people respond with, we want to minimize the meaning of the Holocaust, which is, of course, not true. And it's quite the opposite. I think it's very important to know about colonialism, to understand how the Holocaust actually came to be, to understand, or at least a crucial part of how the Holocaust came to be, and also to understand the present and to understand, again, white supremacy, because you can't understand white supremacy, also not in Germany, if you don't know about um, or fully understand white supremacy, how it works. If you don't um, learn about colonialism and about um, the German role in colonialism, um, there's also where, I mean, a big part of where colonialism um, or the aftermath of colonialism and the Nazi rule actually inter 
intertwined, I would say, was in the um, propaganda against um, the soldiers that came after World War I, uh, French soldiers from colonial territories, from North Africa, from African countries, but also uh, from Asian countries. And there was a huge propaganda against them. Um, it was called Die Schwarze Schmach, and it was uh, uh, portraying um, especially black soldiers as these uh, monstrous uh, people who would rape white women and they would, um, and it was a lot of money was going into that campaign. Um, it was also exported internationally. So there were people from the US actually still uh, also working in this, wearing, um, that were involved in this campaign. So, and you see these narratives, they still play a role today. We still have that, um, that thinking today. And this, um, this uh, propaganda, I think people really don't know that it existed. And um, so there are huge gaps in, in remembrance culture and what is relevant, uh, what was relevant then and is still relevant today. So I would still argue that we need to learn more about colonialism, that um, there needs to be a lot more done and that you can still find the aftermath of colonialism um, almost everywhere in, in Germany. Um, yeah. I organized 2018, 2019, a series of articles uh, about German colonialism. And, mo and a lot of people wrote me after that emails um, with their names, actually. So this is not Twitter, you know, you don't know who's writing you. And most of these emails would tell me, or most of these uh, people giving me feedback would tell me, in a way or another, we just made the Jews happy. Do we need to talk now about black people? Mm -hmm. And they would not use black people always, they would use a racist term. And there was like, actually we need to talk about white people. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this showed me that it said that we need to state the facts and it's 2022 actually, but we need to have that conversation in Germany because people would be offended by reading that in their beloved newspaper that actually after closing the chapter, which is, a, a, which is a problem saying that closing the chapter of the Holocaust, because that's actually the problem if you close the chapter, then now we need to open that new chapter and talk about colonialism. Mm -hmm. And there you can see that there is something in German identity that really needs a broad conversation. We have um, in many German cities, streets uh, named after colonial, um, after men who killed actually people everywhere on earth, in China, in, in what's today Namibia, for example. Um, and there are a lot of initiatives trying to change the names of those streets. We have similar debates. I, I spoke, for example, in Los Angeles with Native American activists, you have similar debates with statues, for example. So maybe you can relate to that. And you would find always a huge white German opposition doing everything to keep the street name of that guy who killed thousands and thousands of people and enslaved actually black people. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking so long about this and came up with the answer that how sad actually is it if your identity as a white German person is connected to that street name, yeah. that you actually, that you are fighting like death and life to keep like activists are being spit on, are being beaten, uh, being targeted for just raising the issue that maybe this street shouldn't be named like this. And therefore you really understand, or I really understand that we're just 
at the beginning of a long and also painful conversation about who Germans want to be. Um, looking at German society and seeing that German society is not anymore a white homogeneous society. It's a very, if you go to Köln, if you go to Berlin, to Frankfurt, to Munich, to bigger cities, you would see a very diverse um, urban society that is not actually okay with having this kind of street name. And that's just one example, like, yeah. you know? We should also think why Germany was a white hegemonious society yeah. in the first place uh, after World War II, it's because they killed everybody and uh, other people had to leave. And this is, I don't know, this is also something that people tend to overlook a lot of times. Yeah. Well, wow. I lot. feel like a party pooper somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody's like, but this is no, but this that is, is German is. history, yeah. and this is and people, and this is also the problem with um, with Germans too. It's because it is so heavy. It is it is unbearable and and to to um, yeah to imagine or to remember. But when people say or I shouldn't even use it's unbearable because that's the problem because people say oh it's so unbearable we need to just let it go mm -hmm. um, because it's so heavy people do not want to go there and people do not want to um, um, engage with this so there's this longing for saying it's over and um, but as we see as soon as people even raise the possibility of thinking of closing the chapter, you see how, um, who it endangers. And uh, that's why we have to keep remembering and also remembering it better than we are now. Yeah. Okay, with the now we're open for questions from the audience. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, I would like to, uh... So two things and then ask questions on them. Um, one thing is, I don't know who is familiar with the numbers of uh, white violence in Germany, because you said there was more violence, there was more murder of victims. The Amadeo uh, Antonio Foundation actually says there's 218 people who have been killed in race, acts of racist or white wing violence since 1990. And that is a uh, conservative number. Those are just uh, the cases that are born. Um, there's a, there most likely more, just to, to give you a feeling what we're talking about. And um, the second thing is you were talking about language, and that reminded me of something that you said that uh, journalists didn't have the language to talk about. It. And um, I'm 42, and when I was young, um, in Germany, we were never talking about racism. We were talking about Ausländer, Frankie Yeah. Hostility towards foreigners. Well, that was never what the problem was because uh, like a white person from Sweden would not have problems while um, a person of color with a German passport would have problems. And I think it's only due to like the activism of anti-racist and left-wing activists and also like, um, journalists like you that we finally talked about, started to talk about racism and only because we talk about racism we can talk about colonialism because um, Obviously, the problem with uh, gender necrophobic in, in East Africa, Germany, East Africa, was not Ausländer Feindlichkeit, it was racism. Yeah. So, until then, we really did not have the language to talk about that. And um, that's why I think it's a very, very important like, turn in the German conversation that we finally admit to ourselves that a problem is racism. And uh, the question I have is um, going back to the very beginning of our today. Um, we're talking about whiteness, and in the German context, there's been a lot of discussion uh, discussion what whiteness is in German, in Germany. Like um, uh, Vasilistianos, Vasilistianos of Kanakata, for example, said um, argued that it's not black and white, but German and not German. That is sort of like the dividing line. And there's questions with like are Polish people, are Ashkenazi Jews, are Russian people, are Ukrainian people in German are they are they of color mm -hmm. or not? So I, I want to ask you what. In your world, what's your definition of whiteness? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And I also think um, there needs to be a lot more conversation at, because it's also steadily evolving, this question. 
for example, we talk about this actually also um, in private. Um, for example, you can say that with Italians, for example, um, when they were also a, a huge group of so-called guest workers. They experienced a lot of racism when they came. And now it, you can really see there is a difference of um, the treatment of Italian people versus Turkish people or Kurdish people. Italian people are, I would say broadly, more accepted and uh, perceived as white. Turkish people, Kurdish people, no, they're clearly um, seen as people of color. So, um, so, and we see that now, for example, um, which is very interesting to see how um, now that there are people, a lot of people coming from Ukraine who are, um, and it's, uh, there's no, like, the, it's a fact that there's a, a very big history of anti-Slavic racism uh, in Germany, but you see there is a difference, or people make it a point to differentiate the refugees coming from Ukraine versus the refugees coming from Syria, Afghanistan, and actually kind of arguing, you know, the people from Ukraine, they are like us. There, you can actually, some people actually stated this, there are these little children with um, uh, blonde hair and blue eyes. So they you see that this is, they're implying, so they are white. So this is why they need our help or they deserve our help. Which is, I'm not saying that the Ukrainian people coming um, will not face racism because they will face some kind of, or I mean, but you still see how people are trying to spin that argument of they are white and the other people are not. So they, to make a, like, uh, to prioritize. So um, I would say it is, so we need to have a nuance, a very nuanced conversation and also a complex conversation when it's about, when you, answer, when you ask this question, it also depends on what are you discussing? When you discuss anti-black racism, when you come from a, from a black view, then I would say probably whiteness is, a, is very broad. It includes a lot of people. Um, when you see it from, but from a white German perspective, you would see people who are not white. That is, um, that actually could also include people from East Germany, it certainly um, includes Jews of any skin color, but you also have to see that you have to be able to talk about white Jews and black Jews because not all of the Jews are white. So, uh, are, yeah, so there is complexity in that question. And I would say um, it's, it really, I don't, so yeah, I would say it depends on the context, but if you would have it in Germany, I would try to argue historically of who is historically, uh, who historically faced oppression and how are the systems of oppression still relevant and present in the institutions today? And, identify those groups and if these groups um, have like they are white presenting I would still not call them white um, when they actually are um, yeah when they actually do face racism so there is a difference between also a Polish person and a Swedish person for example I hope it answered your question but yeah Okay, Professor Small. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephen Small. I'm a professor in African American studies. I'm originally from Liverpool, England. I've been here for a while. I've spent a lot of time in Germany. I mainly work on the UK and on the Netherlands. Okay. And my question is about what is it that black people in Germany are demanding? So in the UK, uh, the UK is the only nation in Western Europe which has institutionalized race relations. We have race relations laws. We have race relations commissions. We have immigration laws that address race. We have positive action. Every other nation in Europe has opposed the institutionalization of race. 
And when I travel around Europe and I go to about 12 countries in Western Europe, black organizations all want an institutionalization of race. They want explicit, direct discussion, including, for example, the organization in Berlin called Each One Teach One. So what I'm curious to know is, uh, what is it that you would say that black people, and I mean people of African descent, not say Turkish, not of this, I know a lot of black people are Muslim, but people of African descent from Africa or from the Caribbean, what would you say that they're mainly demanding as opposed to, uh, you know, responding to whiteness? Yeah, I know that street names is part of it. That's all over the, that's all over the continent, from Spain to Portugal to England. So I, I wonder, I want to hear, yeah. uh, if you don't mind. Sorry, I guess. So um, when you, Black people in Germany, there are a lot of things. I w won't, I can't give you a list, but when you, um, you talked about the Afro Census, which is an initiative of Each One Teach One, it's a Black initiative in Germany that, uh, may, that is making an effort to actually count Black people in Germany for the first time. Because um, the problem is that in Germany, we don't know how many Black people there are in Germany because they are not counted. And if you don't have data, um, you can't, there are a lot of things uh, that you can't study, that you can't really, you can't, um, yeah, you can target a problem that you cannot put into data. So it's a very delicate the reason why Germany doesn't count black people or doesn't count, uh, doesn't categorize, has no census when it comes to race, mm -hmm. is very mm -hmm. evidential because the last time that was the case was under the Nazi rule. Sure. So there is a lot of resistance and scare when people introduce, reintroduce the idea of counting people by race. So we have, the, what we have now is that we only count people with Migrationshintergrund uh, and people without it, meaning that people who have a parent, a non-German parent are counted, but that also, so I'm in a category uh, with the person that has a Dutch, white Dutch father, but we have very different experiences. So this is a demand to make, um, to be able to talk about blackness and also especially about anti-black racism in Germany, you need to know a lot more about black people in Germany. So that is, I would say, a very specific German demand. Black German demand. Black German demand. Um, to make it visible because yeah. it's um, we have a very big problem with ignorance and making making this making anti-black racism invisible. So yeah, that would be Can one I have thing. A question? I don't know if you go go ahead go ahead. Yeah. So uh, can I suggest that the Germans they do know how many black people are there? The French know how many black people. So do the Portuguese, but they don't want to admit it. The only nations in Europe that have a race question in the census are the UK and the Republic of Ireland. And every nation you go to, they say, no, we don't want to do it, we don't want to do it. But they know where the black people are. Mm -hmm. And so what I would ask you is, when white Germans say they don't want a race question because of Nazism, do you believe them? Are they being sincere? <laughs> because most black people, we know it's not true. I mean, it's... So I would say, I mean, it's still, I don't, I wouldn't know, I can't answer if the people do know how many, if Germans really do know how many Black people there are. At least know where the Black people are. Yeah, I mean, they do know, but there is, when I say the data, then you, like, people can work with it. Of course, like, uh, you, if you are Black in Germany, just because you're not counted, you really, you will have a Black experience in Germany, and you will experience racism, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's not a question that you can't just, like, dismiss to be like, oh, it's just an excuse. There is, uh, with the threat of the AFD or right-wing parties gaining popularity, there is a, I can also understand that, um, that scare or that uh, being afraid of when you have that data, when you have that census, what will happen if it falls into the wrong hands? But this is why people like uh, Black Initiative, like Each One Teach One, 
wants to do it themselves. So they have the data, but they have also problem, uh, problems accessing all the black communities, of course. So yeah, that is, um, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Hello, my name is Nicolas from Makira. I'm, I'm Belgian, actually. I have a specific interest in contemporary iconoclasm. Gave a lecture on that topic here uh, last week. Um, I actually wanted to know there's a lot of countries having a debate on colonialism. Uh, Belgium is one of those countries, as is Germany, obviously. Um, and, and we notice that many countries are somehow. Uh, thinking about these topics at the moment, as an academia. What is specific on the German situation? I mean, you mentioned, for instance, the relationship between colonialism and the Holocaust, the rise of the Nazi party. Is it, because I recognize a lot, I recognize a lot of problems, the rise of extreme right wing parties in Germany is very similar to what is happening. My country, I would even say the US. Um, what is specific for the German situation in this? You understand that? Mm -hmm. I do. I think compared, I, I speak French, for example, and when I'm in Paris, I see that. Um, marginalized communities, black people, for example, in the French speaking context are way more organized and way more, you know, um, eager to face white French state centered discourses. And because we had in Germany, the alternative fact that there was no colonialism happening in the first place, we need to begin from zero actually educating like often i'm there i'm like yes there is something like colonialism people would tell me i never heard about it before so a french person i mean that that french person has to be very very uh, i don't know very obviously colonialism colonial power maintained until after world war II, yeah we didn't time in germany colonial rule had to finish in the World War I. So there is a kind of historical reason for that. Yeah, yeah, still, the museums are full of stolen artifacts, for example, mm -hmm. not only in Paris, in London, but also in Berlin. They just opened wow. the Humboldt yeah. Bohem mm -hmm. and they put there like the stolen artifacts and suddenly activists are coming like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, this is nice. You know, this is like, we bought it from you guys, whatever they say. Mm -hmm. And you need to have in Germany at least that conversation from zero. And we didn't, uh, when we talk about colonialism, we need to talk about capitalism, actually. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about ties. If now we are talking about different European perspectives, but uh, I grew up in Morocco and the decisions are made in Paris, actually. In the companies there, Orange, Bouygues, what is, uh, what is constructed in the infrastructure what we eat in, in, in this country, how we live. So also from a German perspective, having like this very export oriented economy, we still don't understand that actually this colonial past has an impact, an economical impact, hegemony, cultural impact that we need to talk about. And that is actually affecting the daily lives of so many people in the former colonial parts of that big German right, not only um, in those cases where you can go back to a history book and say, okay, this is like the, this is like the, this is Africa and this was Belgium, you know, a colonial state and this was France. I'm describing uh, in, in my book, the situation of the bombardment of Northern African regions by the Spanish and the French colonial powers. But the key person there was um, a German uh, a German scientist actually from Hamburg who sold the, to the French and to the, uh, to the Spanish uh, uh, occupying state the weapons that destroyed so many lives till today 
because people, because these were like chemical weapons also used in, in Verdun, for example, uh, during the First World War. And people are suffering today from cancer uh, illnesses and problems because of this little chapter of colonial past in Europe. So we actually um, sometimes have just to try to listen to those people. I, I also understand that we need to talk about the empowerment of minorities within European countries. But what we need to understand is that we need to also talk about how this is connected to the form of periphery where people are still suffering under an economic or cultural hegemony from Germany, from France or the UK. I would also very quickly add that I think it's also important as um, a lot of European countries and especially also Germany um, make it a point to uh, or try to rebuild a European identity. Um, I think it is very important to actually also that Germany also knows about the colonialism about and also takes, understands how they benefit from the colonial rule of other European countries. I also think it is a devastating fact that people in Germany do not know about um, the horrendous crimes of Leopold II, mm -hmm. that they do not, that they can visit Brussels and they see all these huge, beautiful buildings and they don't know how they came to be. And um, so I think if there is an effort to have a European identity, there needs to be an effort to have a, um, a, a yeah, unified remembrance and also um, taking responsibility in the consequences that colonialism um, has today. Um, so, yeah, there are some specific German things, but I also think that only that I actually hate the excuse of the Germans that when they say, well, but the French did it, the Belgians, did it, the British did it. It's still Germany profited of the colonialism of these countries, profited from Machu. So, and yeah, and they were always involved in and participating in the business of it. So, yeah. And once you acknowledge it, we need to have the conversation about reparations, of course. And this is what actually is connecting all the European perspectives. Macron mm -hmm. or uh, Angela Merkel till recently, they actually, when I talk to colleagues working in the center of Berlin and talking to a lot of political decision makers, they would tell me they would not have the problem with going and apologizing to people in Namibia. They would have the problem with the question, if we say we're guilty actually, what do they want? Would they, would they like to have their artifacts back? They like to have money. We don't wanna give them, we don't want to talk about reparations. So sometimes it's also unfortunately very simple why we don't have that kind of conversations. Yeah. And frustrating of course, because when you see that in a pandemic, suddenly so much money is available. You're like, okay, good. Like, uh, uh, this is also sometimes very ridiculous. Sometimes we're talking about a few million euros, for example, to to start actually a process where you could say, let's talk about how to reestablish museum culture in some parts of, of the earth where we took all everything and put it in London so people can enjoy it. I'd like to take this moment to ask our audience members online to please post any questions you have in the Q&A chat box. Now, any other questions? Okay. Uh, my, my name is Zola Bantikin, but this is Dominic Bantikin. First of all, thank you for your time. 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 The German tendency towards being the exporter is not a of remembrance. And, you know, we are good now on all these uh, things related to, to, the, to the history of the German history. And um, given the current debate in Germany about uh, the German guilt and colonialism, 
would you see a tendency to also compete with other European export type of export or type of remembrance and that's in part? We're saying mm -hmm. that we are doing the most to kind of compensate, mm -hmm. uh, remember, and so on. But so, or is it just coded to the third line uh, over calls? Or do you see a similar time set? Also, in a quite recent debate. And if, I mean, and what what are the reasons for being the same or the, 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 the parallels of the two systems? What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, thank you for your question. Yeah. Actually, that's a very interesting question because I would say, with talking about the Third Reich, it's like definitely a competition where a lot of Germans don't see any competition. At, at the same time, looking at Austria, for example, they don't care, you know, uh, about about talking about history. Not all of them, of course, but you know, you, know you understand what I want to say. But at the same time, with colonialism, there is like a race at the bottom. It's not that I would argue that in France, they would like to talk about like what French people did in Algeria, for example. They even didn't start the conversation. We could have another conversation about that here. But it's very interesting actually to observe that with one topic, it's like you have this emotions going on that you have to provide. And that's the problem. This performative way of remembrance you know the most important thing is that you put a kippah on and you go to the synagogue even though you are bothering the people there in that synagogue but you you want to do that you know and the, we all had this kind of situations where we had in a tabloid in germany uh paper kippah actually that you could like just cut out and put like what is this is like this is not halloween this is like not <laughs> appropriate at all Basically, so you have this kind of circus going on, performative circus going on when it comes to talking about the Third Reich and uh, the remembrance culture attached to what uh, happened to, in the Holocaust. And then this way of, you know, I don't want to see colonialism. I don't want to talk about colonialism. And it actually shows a little bit a double standard in talking about history. And this is sometimes um so frustrating yeah. because i wonder if especially decision makers they don't see it or they don't want to see it so i'm i'm not sure about that because i cannot you know i don't know about the intentions themselves but it's something that we need to to actually talk about i would also say yeah there's no germany is not aiming to be it hasn't established a remembrance culture of colonial so colonialism so they can't export it because there is none mm -hmm. so um but what they try to do is that they in the summer of 2020 they tried to actually do something so people would not shed light on on uh, or that they would sh shield themselves from criticism. So they would try to walk a very fine line of doing things that seem very grand as, for example, saying we are gonna pay reparations um, to Namibia and, um, and then, but actually if you looked into it, it was like, okay, but it's not really reparations and it's not going to the victims or the relatives of the victims. It's not going to the Herero and Nama people. And also, basically, you pay this sum, this sum every year. You're just trying to spin it in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, but they try to do it because in this notion of, oh, Germany is uh, takes responsibility in in their um in their past and in and what they did in the past so we do so i think within that summer they try to um perform a little bit of this but it was very it's very complicated when you also have in your capital in berlin just opening up a humboldt forum which contains a lot of this already um, 
spoken about uh, uh, artifacts that uh, are most likely were stolen in, during colonial times. And I also want to point out that it's not only artifacts, there are still also like bones in mm. natural museums in Germany. And um, yeah, from, um, from these colonial times, and uh, there is little effort to um, to bring these uh, remains back. So yeah, can I add something very quick? Uh, something that you would find in very conservative media, you know, is that um, point of view that we in Germany we don't want to end up like those people in the U.S., especially in U.S. academia especially like in a place like Berkeley, where you cannot talk about stuff anymore because you cannot have a conversation anymore because you're not allowed to say a lot of stuff anymore. Sometimes my answer is it's okay that you don't use racist terms. That's the for, for a fact. But it's like they would, they, would, um, they would take the conversations here, for example, looking at the genocide against Native Americans for, for, and say, Oh no, they cannot talk about Columbus anymore. We don't want this. We want, you know, to have freedom of speech. It's not not talking about Columbus. It's like talking, spilling the tea on, on, on Columbus, actually. It's like facts. That's the difference. And this is like something that from a German, especially conservative point of view, is also a kind of a competition saying that we don't want to end like this. And at the same time, I'm so, so happy just to have this conversation here so I can go back to Germany and say, they are doing great, actually. Yeah. They are doing fine. And you wish you would be in Berkeley, actually having mm. that conversation. But this is like the kind of competition that I, that I observe. Yeah. OK, we have time to collect questions. So um, Lisa, um, yeah, thank you. Great to have you here. Um, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also a fellow here at the IES and the GSI. Um, and I grew up in East Germany in the 90s and like saw and experienced a lot of white wing terrorism. And this was like what this became my main motivation to become politically active, but also to move into the field of Holocaust studies. And I wanted to go back um, to the beginning of our talk where you uh, said as like a lack of the contextualization of the Holocaust and among like in the field of Holocaust studies is an established fact. That the Holocaust had a prelude, but also an, uh, an aftermath, and that like Germany is like a post-Nazi uh, country and society we live in. Um, and there's like especially a lot of research being conducted right now by younger researchers like myself and others um, who really like try to highlight like forgotten minority perspectives, but also like showing the continu continuities um, after 1945. But somehow, like this knowledge, I have the feeling doesn't make it into the mainstream mm -hmm. media and into the mainstream debates about memory culture and everything, which is connected to it. So I think one problem is that there's this sharp disconnection between academia and like the mainstream yes. uh, society. But I think it's also a question about like how and like you already said it, who is allowed to talk, like which perspectives gain like interest or like uh, visibility and so it's about I would say age, uh, class, uh, race and um, everything connected to it. Uh, so my question would be like in your personal opinion um, to ask you what do you think needs to happen that we can shift this discourse like this uh, dominance culture mm -hmm. and like what kind of like practical strategies um, are helpful or like yeah. um, what kind of like positive maybe experiences that we made from like you're connecting right? yes and then one more do you have a question yes. yes um thank you very much for sharing your knowledge um i um i have a question around the people who are called the guest person and the uh, remembrance culture around that in Germany um so i was wondering is is that mostly often talked about and there is a narrative around it, is it thought and true? And is it like sometimes uh, are parallels drawn? Um, but yeah, 
So, to your question, I think as a journalist, it is, I am, um, what I could observe is that the, when it comes to these topics, the, there is not a good line between journalists and academia because journalists, it's the, it's, uh, the task of journalists to communicate these findings, to discuss them, um, to put, yeah, to ex uh, give uh, a platform to experts so this conversation can be driven forward. Um, that is not really working well in Germany, I would say. And um, uh, that is a complicated, why that is, it's complicated, but I would say the, the relationship between media and academia when it, in this specific field is not well. And this is a problem. Um, and it also contributes that the, yeah, the findings that in academia, these conversations or these things are evolving, but in the mainstream, it is not. Um, and from a journalist side, I have to say, I'm very frustrated that people would very often ignore these um, academic discourses to push more of that sentiment that this that these conversations and these impulses only come from like people who are emotionally fragile and very hurt and that this is not something that is based on historic facts um, but rather on like sentiments and um, you can also see you can see that in other fields as well but you can see that when uh, academia actually provides information that actually um, strengthens the argument of a certain you know um, certain political view when it's then people would say, this is not academia, this is activism. <laughs> like it becomes something else. It becomes not objective or neutral anymore. So people um, tend to ignore it because they would say, well, but this is very opinionated or this is very framed in such a way. So this is, I think, a huge problem and a very, um, when I want to be nice and diplomatic, I would say a very a misunderstanding of how academia and how these findings work. Um, and when you are frank, what do you say? I would say it's deliberate yeah. and people do not want to, yeah. like people don't, uh, don't want to go there. And it's actually the journalists uh, gatekeeping this um, or not, they either do it deliberately or they're very incompetent, I would have to say, when it comes to discussing or integrating conversations about race and racism, about uh, historic facts. When you saw when people were talking about um, the conversations of racism arise in 2020, I was shocked how little journalists considered to look into academia and look what people have already found out there are publications. It's not that there is no information out there. The journalists pretend as though there is nothing out there. What they do is turn to Twitter, ask a random person that is tweeting about racism and say, be our expert, come and talk about, answer these very complicated questions. And of course this person is not able to. And then it looks as though this is like a made up sentimental thing. And it's very frustrating to me. So I would say, yeah, there needs to be more. We need to have, a, we need to strengthen the, um, the communication aspects of academia, like the line between getting this information out there. Somebody who is uh, fit in this discourse, but also equipped to translate it in, for a broader audience. I think um, just adding one thing about the continuity, it's very difficult to give a general answer to that. It, de it depends on which field you're talking about. If you have a look to the justice system, for example, the yeah. continuity is there. Uh, I had the feeling uh, talking also to, to some 
um, researchers that there was big, big opposition in talking about the, this kind of continuities in German law texts, mm -hmm. for example, or in the way that, you know, the justice system itself is organized in Germany. They had some initiatives, definitely, but they are like at the beginning of, the, of that conversation. At the same time, of course, in art, more artistic uh, conversations, uh, there is certainly a little bit more space to talk and have a conversation. There was this very good uh, exhibition at the Dutch uh, Historische Museum in Berlin about artists just continuing their work after 45 and getting a lot of money and being professors everywhere in Germany and actually sometimes also building memorials for Holocaust uh, survivors or for the Holocaust while being with Hitler basically himself before 45. So it depends which field we are talking about. So, but definitely it's something sometimes very frustrating if you actually um, feel that there is this opposition and you cannot answer why, because I don't know if people, they want to protect their grandparents or whatever, um, but definitely it's something to overcome still in Germany. And thank you for your questions about the uh, Gastarbeiter. Definitely there is a conversation which is also um, very weird. Actually, we just had a couple of weeks ago, the anniversary of the uh, treaty between the Turkish and the German government, uh, which also had a kind of performative way of remembrance. Remembrance is maybe also the wrong term here because it was actually designed as a party. A like a celebration thing between like diplomatic celebration. There was the problem with the pandemic, but they would less speak with the people actually um, or the second or the third generation and talk more between governments. And then you would have like interesting programs with a very romantic view of people coming into Germany, you know, and working. And now we are like one, like, not, I mean, I wish actually, and there you have like a lot of uh, perspectives which are not even considered. Um, so I think there also it's uh, changing and shifting with more and more younger people from the third and fourth generation being able to express themselves in arts, in academia and journalism. So I'm really looking forward to have a look what's coming up in the next uh, couple of years. And then if we can like talk about remembrance, mentioning also all the pain and all the violence, these people suffered in Germany. And, you know, I'm describing this with my parents being treated like animals actually, who have to work and, you know, and then please go back because you are just guests. So we don't have this kind of conversation yet in Germany, but it's very, very important to have some peace in society to be able to express this kind of family stories, especially. Alice, would you like to add anything? Mm, no. <laughs> All right, well, I see that we are at time. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank both of our panelists, Mohammed and Alice, for lending us your time and your expertise. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Heike Friedman, and Ray Savord from the Pacific Regional Office at the German Historical Institute here in Berkeley. I would like to thank our partners at the Goethe Institute San Francisco, Noemi Jengiru and Bettina Bodianka. I would like to thank also my colleague, Isabel Richter, who is the DAD professor in history and German at those departments here at UC Berkeley. And of course, I want to thank all of you in the audience, uh, virtually and in person, for participating and join us. Let me say that this series uh, on memory culture in Germany will continue on March 30th with Dr. Dwayne Jethro uh, at the Center for Curating the Archive from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and Dr. Miriam Bruges from the German Historical Institute in London. They'll be in conversation with my colleague, Dr. Isabel Richter. And then the final event will be on May 4th with author and illustrator, Nora Krug in conversation with Dr. Bettina Rodianka from the Goethe Institute. 
We hope you can join us uh, another time at the Institute of European Studies for these and other events. Until then, thank you and good night. Thank you.